for the technology getting together. Thank you for ways to work around it. Thank you for uh, uh, the capacity to troubleshoot. And so we're here, we're live, and we're grateful to you. Lord, use the time that you've given us to speak to us, to speak to your people, to speak to us clearly, to speak to us effectively. Help us to hear your words, to hear your voice. Let the seeds that come through your spirit land in fertile soil. Let our hearts and our minds be good ground so that when those seeds are planted in your season, in your time, they will bring forth a great harvest, some 30, some 60, even some 100 fold. In Jesus name, we pray. Amen and amen. And so again, um, thank you all for your patience. We're so grateful to be on with you once again for another Sunday session. So um, a, a couple things. Uh, uh, we have been walking through the book of Matthew with the objective being that we are doing a comprehensive, deep study, deep analysis, deep review of the gospel according to the four writers uh, that shared their accounting, their experience, their perspective and view of the gospel, the good news, the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so we started with Matthew. Matthew is the first one listed in the New Testament. Matthew, in terms of chapters, is the longest. Um, I think in terms of like words and length, I think Luke might actually be the longest. Um, uh, but we started off with Matthew. And so here we are, part four. We broke in uh, uh, the Matthew into four uh, parts, four sections. And so we here, here we are in part four. And uh, I said at the onset, I said at the beginning that this is, this is the heaviest lift. Family, this is the heaviest lift. This section, um, the last seven chapters, 21 through 28, uh, there is, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. There's a lot here that's happening. And so let's jump into it. We start out right off in 21. And so Jesus is making his way finally down into Jerusalem. Last week, we looked at the transfiguration. We looked at the confession of Peter. We looked at the conversation. And if you didn't get Bible study yet, make sure you download Bible study. We looked at the conversation of who would be the greatest in the kingdom and and what the kingdom of heaven is like and, and the various parables that Jesus taught on the kingdom. And so Jesus has been preparing himself and he's been preparing his disciples for this moment, for this time, for this, this instant. Um, uh, God bless you, Isabel. So good to see you. Thanks for jumping on again uh, this afternoon. Welcome, welcome, love you. Um, and so we, we once again um, are in this place where um, uh, Jesus is, is, this is the climax. I mean, this is, this is the holy week. This is the culmination of, of 30 years of life on earth and three years of, of hard charging, dedicated evangelism and missionary work um, going all over the region, going all over the area. Um, and sharing his teaching, sharing his good news, and preparing people for um, a, a, this moment, for his death. And I think it's important to understand, clarify, and recognize that, that Jesus came to die. Jesus is very clear that that is sort of the, 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 not the crescendo, the resurrection is the crescendo, but in order to resurrect, he's got to die. And so Jesus is very clear on kind of what the mission is. That will come into play a little bit later on um, in the message. So I want you to sort of hold on to that notion that Jesus has been very clear from the beginning what he's here for, what, he, what he's here to do. And so, um, so we are now in Holy Week, High Holy Week. And so Jesus is coming into Jerusalem as we get to sort of this climax, this crescendo, uh, this building uh, of, of all things coming together. And so Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey and uh, the crowd, the crowd is yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we'll, we'll, let's, let's look at that together um, uh, uh, briefly. We want to go to Matthew 21. We're going to go to Matthew 21 and we want to look at um, those first uh, those first couple verses, the entrance, Christ's entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, and let's go to, oh, we'll start at verse one. We'll start at verse one. 
Um, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying, go into the village in front of you. Immediately you'll find a donkey, essentially, you know, and, and tell the individual there, tell the owner of the donkey um, that the master has need of it, right? The Lord needs them, as we see in verse three. Um, and so uh, and now uh, uh, verse four, they took place. This took place. Jesus riding on the donkey took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. This is Isaiah on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. He didn't come in on a horse. He didn't come in on this, this gallant steed. I mean, again, just Jesus is just flipping the script and he's shifting the paradigm and he's calling into question all the things that we thought we understood or held true of Messiah, of leadership, of the purpose of Messiah. Jesus did not come in on a horse, on a white triumphant horse that, you know, that that comes later. John talks to us about that in, in the revelation of Jesus Christ. But in, in terms of coming into Jerusalem, He's fulfilling what Isaiah said. Remember, Isaiah is the one that was preparing us for this humble, suffering servant that was coming to flip the kingdom paradigm by suffering and serving and dying in order to conquer death, in order to conquer the enemy of this world. And, and, and so Jesus doesn't come in on a horse. He comes in on a donkey. Verse 6, the disciples went. And did as Jesus directed them, they brought the donkey and the colt, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd, this is now as he's going into Jerusalem, listen to this. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. What does Hosanna mean? Hosanna means it transliterates the Hebrew expression that was originally a cry for help, save. In time, it became this invocation of a blessing. In, in acclamation, the people praise God in the highest heavens for sending the Messiah. So if Hosanna re retains some of its original force, it is this cry for deliverance. That comes from the biblical scholar D.A. Carson. So Hosanna means be prosperous. So when the crowd is yelling, Hosanna to the son of David, they're saying be prosperous, or as we saw what, what or we heard what, what D.A. Carson told us, that it's this invocation of blessing. It's this, this acclamation, uh, 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 this, this summoning for prosperity and deliverance. So Hosanna also means save now. And so what the crowd is saying when they say Hosanna to the son of David, they're saying, save us now, Messiah. Hosanna to the son of David means save us now or save now, Messiah. So they recognize, the crowd recognizes that they, they, they get it, even though He's coming in on this colt, on this, 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 this donkey, this beast of burden. They know and they recognize and they acknowledge. They have a sense as to what's going on here. Now, you know, how quickly things will change. But there is still this, this, this hope that Messiah is going to save. He's going to save now. Hosanna to the son of David, save now, Messiah. So the Israelites were expecting the Messiah to come and topple authority. And in a sense, that's actually one of the first things that Jesus does when he gets into Jerusalem. What happens when Jesus gets to Jerusalem? Look at verse 12 of chapter 21. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seat of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of robbers. So what, what's happening here? The, the purpose was to drive out the merchants who in cooperation with the priests 
were cheating the visitors of Jerusalem by forcing them to purchase their animal sacrifices at an exorbitant rate, at an exorbitant cost. They they were charging, you know, what has uh, uh, since come to know as like kind of a convenience fee. Well, their convenience fee was something like, you know, 20 or 30 percent upcharge. It was it was it was outrageous. It was unrighteous. It was ungodly. And Jesus was just completely turned off and offended. And in his righteous indignation, turns over the table of the money changers and drives out the, the, the sellers and the animals. Drive, drives them all out, the sellers and the animals. Now, Jesus didn't institute any policy change. So I don't, I want to be careful. I don't want to say that this was short sighted in any way, because uh, clearly Jesus was responding to the offense in the moment. But this was not lasting change. I mean, there's no, there's no indication uh, that those money changers and those sellers just didn't come back the next day. There's no indication that, uh, it, it, that Jesus did something that had this transformative effect, not in this moment, but he does absolutely act on this, this spirit of kind of righteous jealousy, the spirit of utter offense to God. And so Jesus attacks the existing power structure, except it isn't Rome. It isn't Rome in this situation. The power structure that Jesus is attacking is the religious hierarchy, is the religious leadership, is the religious authority. That's, that's the, 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 the toppling over um, that, that, that Jesus is, is dealing with. And so Jesus drives out uh, uh, the money changers. The biblical scholar Barclay says, in that uproar of buying and selling and bargaining and auctioneering, prayer was impossible. Those who sought God's presence were being debarred from it, from the very people that were responsible for God's house. So think about that as well, that, that it was supposed to be, it is written, that, that the temple would be a house of prayer, and the religious leaders, along with the merchants, have turned it into a den of robbers. So not only were they making it difficult for people to pray with all of the transactions that were taking place in the outer court, making it difficult for people to actually access and get into the temple to get to God's presence. And, and, and so, you know, I do want to take a second, say we could teach on that a little bit later, but no, I do want to take a second. I do want to take a minute because we need, we need to get this. We need to get this. The religious leadership had actually physically, metaphorically and physically set up obstacles to make it difficult for people to get to the presence of God. The religious leaders with their policies, with their systems, with their attempt at, at commerce and raising funds, developed physical barriers that kept people from getting to the presence of God. Their responsibility is to serve as the intercessors, as the intermediaries. Their responsibility is to help people into God's presence. And the religious leaders had actually made it difficult. They had set up barriers to God's presence. We, we, this is why Jesus lays into them in chapter 23. We won't actually have a lot of time to go into that this afternoon. We'll do chapter 23. Uh, 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 in Bible study later this week, where, I mean, Jesus lays into the religious leadership. Seven times he calls them hypocrites and, and, and just lays into them. And so here's the takeaway, family. Here's the point. If there are barriers, if there are policies, if there are rules, I'm not talking about a, a, a Christ teaching. I'm talking about man-erected, man-established principles, 
uh, 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 wearing pants, I mean, women wearing pants is, is, is somehow unrighteous. Uh, uh, women wearing earrings is somehow uh, unrighteous. Men uh, wearing beards or men shaving their head. When we set up these, these misguided, uh, narrow focused religious laws and policies that make it difficult for people to get to the presence of God, we are standing in God's way and the Holy Spirit's way of doing the work that we were sent here to help make happen. If at any point in time, I am, am advocating uh, for some process or some principle or some ideology that, that makes it difficult for people to get to God's presence, I am acting in the capacity of a godless Pharisee that is out of line. And I think it's so important that we understand that. I think it's so important. It's my responsibility as the pastor here at Connected Church to empower anyone that, that, that partners, anyone that participates, anyone that, that, is, that, that is interested in what we're doing. It is so important. It's critical to me that I empower you to understand that 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 church and that that the institution, the mechanism, the edifice whether it's physical or digital or what have you, is meant to make it easier for you to get to God's presence, not harder. And any time the church, whether it's an individual or a group, a, a community, a, a policy, a law, any time the church, the big C church is making it difficult for people to get to God's presence, the church is out of line. Jesus, help us, Holy Ghost. And so Jesus came to flip that, to literally flip that. He flipped over the tables of the money changers. He drove them out of the outer courts to open up the way, to literally, metaphorically open up the way for people to get into the presence of God. This is the metaphoric symbol of what he does physically later when he goes on the cross and then he goes in the grave and then he's resurrected on high and he sends the Holy Spirit so that there is now no longer a barrier. There is no veil of separation. There is nothing that prevents you and I from accessing the Holy of Holies because of the work that Jesus Christ did metaphorically he opened up a way for people to get into the temple and literally through his death his burial and resurrection Jesus has made a way I hope you're getting excited the way that I'm getting excited has made a way for you and I to access his presence at any time through the gift of the Holy Spirit can you say hallelujah right where you are can you give God a clap of praise? Can you open your mouth and say, thank you, Jesus, right where you are? If you feel more comfortable just saying it on the inside of your mind and your heart, but can we just take 15 seconds and celebrate God, however it makes sense for you, however you feel it, to, to celebrate God for making a way for you and I through Christ's spirit to access his presence. Oh God, I thank you for the veil being torn. Jesus, I thank you for your spirit that has come to give us access to the throne room of God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, my God. <laughs> Ooh, I told y'all this was heavy lifting. Uh, I'm, I am past my time, but that's all right. This is good. Th this is good. So, um, so we want to jump ahead. We want to jump ahead. I'm going to take a little bit of time here. And if we go a little bit over, that's okay. I want you to hang with me. Because I want to look at exactly what, we just, what we're leading up to. So I want to look at 26, 27, and 28. I want to look at Jesus being betrayed i want to look at the last supper and then i want to look at the crucifixion and, and resurrection okay 
So, so Jesus is, is, is in Jerusalem and he's preparing. And so he, he sends some of his disciples and you'll see a certain man and, and Matthew leaves his name out on purpose because even though this is sometime later, remember Christians are still being persecuted and supporters of Christians are being persecuted. So Matthew doesn't give us this individual's name, I think largely to probably protect the individual. Uh, but there was a certain man and he has a, uh, he's got a room, an upper room, where uh, they're going to prepare for the Passover meal. And so the disciples are, are, are going to do that. Before that happens, in chapter 26, you'll see it um, uh, in the early part of the chapter, um, uh, Jesus is visiting with some friends, and, and a woman comes in uh, and anoints Jesus with, with, with the alabaster box. In, in, in chapter six, um, he's in the house of Simon, the leper, and a woman with her alabaster box, this very expensive perfume, anoints Jesus's feet. And, you know, there's this uproar and uh, the disciples are just, you know, that should have been sold. That was so much money. And, and you know, what does Jesus say? She, she knows what she's doing. She's preparing my body. I've been trying to tell y'all that I'm about to die. This woman came to prepare my body for death. And so whenever you talk about what I teach, whenever you talk about my life, mention this woman and mention this story because she got the revelation. She understood what needs to happen. And, and so what, whatever exchanges that led up to this, Judas is then utterly offended and Judas goes to the religious leadership and, and, you know, what, what do you give me if I'll betray Jesus? 30 pieces of silver, current exchange rates, depending on how you want to look at it, probably wasn't more than about $5,000. $5,000, Jesus, Ju Ju Judas valued Jesus's life at about 5,000 bucks. All the healing, all the teaching, all the ministering, and Judas takes five grand for Jesus's life. I just, I don't, I, I, Judas doesn't need to be vilified any more than Judas has already been vilified. But you and I, I told you this is heavy lifting today. You and I need to consider, do we ever put a price on Jesus's head? What's it worth? What's Jesus's life worth to you? Is it worth one more look? Is it worth one more listen? Is it worth one more bite? Is it worth one more moment? That, that, that is something that we all need to do each and every day. Are we valuing Jesus's life? Or are we selling them out for a couple grand? So then we get to the Passover and, and what, what, what is Jesus doing here by equating, equating, excuse me, equating his body and his blood to, to the, the Passover bread and the wine? What is Jesus doing? What Jesus is doing is he's instituting a practice whereby the Jewish reader, because remember, Matthew is writing to whom? Matthew is writing to Jews, at least that was, uh, that was absolutely among his target audience. And so by doing this, by including this, the way that it's included, Matthew is speaking to Jews and Jesus is speaking largely to Jews. Passover is a Jewish custom. This is not a Gentile custom. This is not a Gentile celebration. This is not a, uh, I don't I actually even know if the Samaritans who were half Jew uh, observed Passover with any regularity, but this, I mean, this is, you know, this is Christmas for, for uh, a Jews. Passover is, is, is the big one. They're led out of Egypt. They're delivered from captivity. Jesus came to deliver us from the captivity of sin and death. And so Jesus puts himself 
in the place of the Passover feast. Here's the bread. Here's the unleavened bread. He breaks it. He serves it to his disciples and says, this is my body that has been broken. As often as you take this, remember me. Remember what I'm about to do. And he pours the, the wine in the cup, which is the symbol of the blood. It was the symbol of the blood that was on the doorpost and the mantle that, that, that you had to mark the, the, the sides and the top of your door in order for the death angel to pass over. And he pours the wine in the cup and he passes it around and he says, this is my blood that's been poured out. Hallelujah, Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus is now the Passover feast. Jesus is the unleavened bread that needed to be eaten quickly, that needed to be prepared and eaten quickly, because at any moment they would be summoned, the Jews would be summoned to exit out of, of Egypt. And, and Jesus' blood is the wine, and it's, and it's the symbol of the blood that, that allows death to pass over us. And so in Jesus, we have the body and the blood. In Jesus, we have now the capacity and the means to escape the grip of death in this world. And so they have the Passover feast. They have the Last Supper. And, and, and Jesus is trying once again to prepare them and to make them aware of what happens and they sing a hymn and they're heading out and Jesus issues a warning to one of his closest friends. I wanna look at this together. Chapter 26, verse 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all, fall away because of me this night for it is written i will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will scatter but after i am raised up i will go before you to galilee peter answered him though they fall away because of you i will never you got to love peter's conviction and i promise you in that moment he meant it in his bones he meant it in his body he meant every word of that thing I know that he meant it because I know I've made pledges and I've made statements and I've made declarations to God in a moment. And like Paul said, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And if you be honest with yourself, people of God, children of God, if you be honest with yourself, you, like me, have sat in the seat of Peter. I will never fall away. In verse 34, Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter says back, even if I must die, Peter doubles down. Jesus is warning him, Peter, this is going to happen. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples say the same. And so the, 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 we, we then move to, to Gethsemane. And what happens in Gethsemane is, is transformative. Because we see Jesus in his most human and in his most divine. And so Jesus gathers the 12 and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're in the mount. And so they're going a little further to, to this garden. And Jesus tells the 12 to wait and pray. And he takes his, 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 his team, his core team, his homies with him a little bit further. He takes Peter, James, and John. And, and he's, he's, oh, Jesus. He's the most vulnerable he's been. He's the most vulnerable he's been because he knows his betrayal is moments away. It's hours away at this point. And the weight 
of what he's about to endure is bearing on him like no other time that we see described in scripture. I got to take my time, family. I'm sorry. I need you to just hang in there with me. We need to do this together. You need to experience this in this moment. The weight of what Jesus is about to endure has never been heavier. He knows what's hours away. And it's not just the physical pain that he's about to endure. I need you to understand this. It's not just the beatings. It's not just the crown. It's not the mocking. It's not the punching and the spitting and the nails and, 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 and being hung on the cross. It's not just that. There's no doubt that that was contributing to the pain that was awaiting him just hours away there's no question that that was bearing down on him but what was bearing down on him even more was the weight of sin that was going to have to be placed on his shoulders and the temporary separation that was going to take place between he and his father because god could not touch the sin of the world and so in order for Jesus to do this work, Jesus was going to have to be hung on the cross. And there was going to be a moment where Jesus was going to have to say, Daddy, where did you go? Daddy, where are you? And for the first time in his life, Jesus was going to feel alone. He was going to feel alone. And the weight of that crippled him. And he tells his friends, his innermost circle, can you please just stay awake with me? Can you please just stay awake with me? I'm going over a little bit further to pray. Can you stay awake for an hour and pray? And you need to pray because something is coming. And this is not the time to sit idle. And this is not the time to sit passive. You need to pray because something is coming. And he takes a few more steps and he just buckles under the weight and he falls face down and he's begging his father, remove this cup from me. Now, I know what we like to do, and I like to do it too, because I don't like to think about Jesus this way. I don't want to think about Jesus buckled by the weight and the pressure and the burden of what was to come. I like to think about Jesus walking on water. And I like to think about Jesus saying, I am, and people just falling down like dead men. I like to think about Jesus in his glory and in his power. But today's title is less, is, is today's message is titled Matthew part four, Jesus in all his glory, because as he's laying face down on the ground, we see Jesus in all his humanity humanity and we need to be reminded the miracle of Jesus Christ is not that he was simply God that came to earth in flesh the miracle of Jesus Christ was that he was always fully human that he was never not 100% human and here we see Jesus in the beauty and vulnerability in the frailty of his humanity and he's face down on the ground. And he's begging his father to move the cup. And that at some point, at some point, what does he say? What does he say? Verse 39, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup, let this cup pass from me. And, and, and so the English Standard Version then has a semicolon in the word nevertheless. So semicolon grammatically means that it's sort of 
it's the end of one thought and the start of another, but it still sort of fits within the same framework. So it's not necessarily a period. God bless you, Sister Ruth Davis is on. God bless you, Mom. Welcome. So so good to see you. So the, it's not a period in that Jesus stopped one thought and started a new thought. What he's saying here, what Matthew is, is, is inferring, because again, Matthew wasn't there, right? No one is listening. No one is overhearing Jesus at this point. This is inspiration by the Holy Spirit. And so grammatically, what Matthew's doing here is that there, there's this, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless. And so it's not the end of, it's not the let this cup pass from me, stop, and then a different thought. It's, I don't want to do this. I have no interest in enduring what's about to come. Nevertheless, however, in addition to, if it be your will. If it be your will. And, and we like to jump to nevertheless. But I would encourage you to spend some time and sit in with Christ. Let this cup pass from me. Sit there and meditate and contemplate and consider those words. Jesus Christ, the son of David, Messiah, Savior of the world, fell on his face in a garden and begged the father to remove this cup. Just, just allow yourself to meditate on that. And then go on to nevertheless. Because here's the point. There's not a period there because Jesus didn't say, let this cup pass from me, stop the thought. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. I understand that there's more to be done. And so if it be your will, let the cup pass. But most importantly, it's not my will, it's your will. So nevertheless, my father, nevertheless, my king, nevertheless, my God, nevertheless, the creator of the whole world, nevertheless, not my will. Not as I will, but as you will. And so he goes and he sees his disciples sleeping and rouses them and asks them to pray with him. And he goes back to pray and God bless you, Sister Polanco. So good to see you. Thanks for joining us. He goes on to, to, to pray a little bit longer and then goes back and, and wakes them and says, it's now, it's, it's time. It's time for the Son of Man to be betrayed. And so, um, as is a very normal custom, it, it was not uncommon at all when, when friends see each other, when, when, when men see one another and greet one another to give each other a kiss on the cheek, a sign of affection and, and compassion, relationship. And so Judas tells the, the soldiers, the Roman guard, the one I kiss is, is the one. And so this is where we get the expression, the kiss of death. And so Judas greets his teacher with a kiss. And What's interesting is when we go back to the upper room, to the Last Supper, Jesus announces that he's going to be betrayed. And what do all the disciples do? They all look around. Oh, is it me? Is it me? Is it you? Me? You? You? Right? In the end, they all betrayed him. Which is why I said I'm not going to vilify. Judas gets vilified plenty. This is not a pile on Judas moment. Judas gets vilified, and for good reason. I'm not taking anything off. Judas gets vilified for a very good reason. You know who also betrayed him? John and Matthew and Bartholomew and, and James and, and James, the son of Alphaeus and, and Peter called Simon and, and Philip and Nathaniel and Thaddeus, Bartholomew. They all betrayed him too. 
Because when the Romans showed up, Peter called himself doing, God knows what Peter called himself doing, trying to chop off uh, the high priest's assistant, his right hand, try to chop his head off, misses, cuts the ear off, and Jesus is, Jesus is like, what, what, have you not understood anything of what I've taught you? And so Jesus puts the ear back on the man's head, repairs his ear, uh, uh, tells them, do what you have to do. And all the disciples take off. All of them take off. Nobody stays with Jesus. Nobody gets arrested with Jesus. Nobody says, if you want to take Jesus, you got to take me too. They take Jesus into custody and everybody else takes off. They all betrayed him. They all betrayed their teacher, their friend. They all betrayed him. And, and so he appears before the, the high priest and, and, and you, you, you know how the the story proceeds from this point. Here, here are some key takeaways. And, and if you haven't spent some time this week, or if you haven't spent some time leading up to this point, I certainly want to encourage you to spend some time this week, especially in anticipation of Bible study, looking at it and really taking your time and going through Matthew chapters 26, 27, and 28. And, and so what, what Jesus is, what Jesus endures and in, just in terms of the utter disrespect and the disgust the the mockery of, of, of by those that he created this jesus is the word of god jesus is the breath of god jesus is jesus says when you see the father you see me i and the father are one jesus breathed life into these the, these these creatures and they would disrespect him and they would disregard him and they would mock him. And he, and he, and he won't, he won't advocate for himself. He won't curse them. He won't fight back. He endures the humiliation. He endures the mistreatment. He endures the suffering largely in silence. Pilate is, 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 is trying to get something because Pilate, doesn't want to crucify him for no reason. Pilate's trying to get something out of him and Jesus won't give him anything. Pilate's wife is, you should have nothing to do with this man. You should have nothing to do with this man. I got a bad feeling you need to stay as far away from this as possible. And so what does Pilate do? Pilate sends him to Herod. Oh yeah, he's from Galilee. That, that's Herodian territory. Uh, 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 Herod, Herod will, 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 will rule over this. Herod will offer judgment. And, you know, Herod and, and, and his soldiers have a turn. They give him a scarlet robe, and that's where the, the crown of thorns is twisted and, and placed on his head. They put a scepter in his hand, and, and Herod has a good old time mocking Jesus. But he's not going to touch it with a, with a ten-foot pole. He's not going to condemn him. He's not going to have him crucified. And so, you know, Herod says, no, this is, this is Adam, I, king of the Jews. I don't, if, if, if he's claimed to be a king, that's not an offense to me. That's an offense to Caesar. Pilate, you need to handle this. And so there is some irony in that Pilate and Herod sort of form this bond over passing Jesus's judgment back and forth. But ultimately, it's, it's the time of Passover. And, and so one criminal is is exonerated is pardoned so you know the governor pardons a a, a, a a prisoner and and so i can i can set free your king this king of the jews or i can set free an actual criminal an actual murderer barabbas who is guilty of killing romans in an insurrection and and who do the Jews want? They want Barabbas. They want the murderer. They want the, the spotless lamb to take his place on the cross. And so Jesus is scourged and, 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 and whipped and beaten. And 
Jesus is, is crucified. And, and uh, Pilate wants to, to wash his hands and, and, and to be done with it. Um, but we, 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 to this day, right, who declared the order? Now, you know, Pilate tries to do some, some redeeming things on the, on the cross. The, 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 the charge is here is Jesus, King of the Jews, and the Pharisees, religious leaders, wanted it changed to he said he is king of the Jews, Pilate refuses to change it and, and, and declares, more or less declares Christ king. And, uh, and, and, and so Jesus is, is given his cross and Simon of Cyrene is summoned by the, the Roman guard to carry Christ's cross because he's just, he's so broken at this point and, and, and so weak and, and beaten that he, that he can't carry his own cross to Golgotha, to the place of the skull, and um, he is there crucified, and he's crucified. So not only is a criminal released in his place, he's also cross crucified along with two other criminals. And, and so I, I, I want us to keep that in mind that our savior at the time of his most important work was surrounded by criminals. The next time we wanna get on our high horse, next time we wanna be judgmental, remember that there was a thief who saw Jesus for who he was and declared him Messiah. And Jesus granted him access to his kingdom. Chapter 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Daddy, 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 where are you? And some bystanders heard it, said this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. It is finished as it's recorded in other uh, uh, other um, examples, other perspectives, other perspectives. I believe Luke captures um, uh, that that statement. It is finished, and and yielded up his spirit, gave up the ghost, and Jesus is buried, and a guard is placed outside the tomb so that no one will steal the body because. There, there is also the, the sentiment that he's going to be raised again. He, he's, he's going to raise up. Remember, he said he's going to die. He's going to come back to life. And, and so uh, to, to avoid um, uh, the, the spectacle of that, there's, there's, a guard, there's a huge stone rolled in place, and there's a guard that, uh, that, that, that's stationed there so that no one can come and, and steal the body. And, uh, and a couple of angels roll the stone away uh, as, as our Lord steps out of the grave and, and in his glory. And so we go, oh, Jesus, we go from the garden to the grave. And in the garden, Jesus is laid down, oh, Jesus, I want to preach this thing. God, I want to preach this thing. In the garden, Jesus is laid face down near death in his humanity. The garden is a place of life. The garden is a place where, 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 where vegetables and flowers grow and flourish. The garden is a place of life, but for Jesus, that garden was a place of death. 
He had to die to his self-will. He had to die to his ambition. He had to die to what he wanted. And so he's face down in a garden and they take my Jesus to the grave and they put the stone over the grave and they station two guards on the grave. But for my Jesus, who represents a flipping of paradigms, for my Jesus, who represents a flipping of the script, for my Jesus, who represents doing things differently, the grave didn't mean death. No, for my Jesus, he went to the grave so that he could live. My Jesus went to the grave so that he could be raised again my Jesus went to the grave so that he could conquer death so that he could have full life see my Jesus went to the grave to bring you and me life and so my Jesus's body is put in a grave but three days later baby angels show up and they roll the stone away and Jesus laid his face down in a garden but Jesus stepped out of the grave tell somebody Jesus stepped out of the grave put it in the chat he was face down in the garden but he was standing tall in the grave hallelujah hallelujah you need to know you might have to go face down but you're not going to stay there you might have to lay prostrate and cry out to your daddy cry out to your father but your grave is coming your stepping out party is coming who else stepped out of a tomb when jesus said lazarus come forth lazarus stepped out of the tomb had to take his grave clothes off jesus went to the grave to step out of the tomb and step into full life so that you and I are not conquered by death. You and I are not beaten by death. You and I are not destroyed by death. See, for you and I, it's a transition. It's an exit and an entrance into another dimension, leaving this kingdom and going into daddy's kingdom where we can have life forevermore. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for the grave. Thank God for the grave. Thank God for the grave. And so Jesus goes from face down in the garden to stepping out of the grave. And he stepped out into all power and all authority. Grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? It's been swallowed up in the glory of our heavenly father family I, I i appreciate you i'm so sorry we got started a little late this afternoon uh but i appreciate you hanging in there with us and 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 spending just a portion of your sunday with us here at my connected church our website is myconnectedchurch.com if you are hearing this message for the first time and 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 you're new to this idea, this notion of, of Christianity or following Jesus or you know, Charles, what is that all about? And, and, and I don't understand. And, and, and what Jesus died for me and Jesus is, is God, but Jesus was a man and it's just too much. I understand. I understand. God understands most importantly, which is why we have church which is why we have these services so that we can come together and we can learn together but it starts it starts with a step it starts with a step and if you are ready to accept jesus christ today jesus is ready jesus is ready to fill your life with his holy spirit well charles how do i how do i do that what happens what do i need to do you need to believe. First and foremost, before anything else, you need to believe. And there's a very simple way to demonstrate that belief. And it's talking. It's, it's, it's talking, it's communicating, it's confessing with your mouth. See, we talk, we communicate, however we communicate. We communicate because we believe it's being heard. 
even if you're like me, you talk to yourself, you could hear yourself. So you know it's being heard. But when we get into conversations with other people, we talk with them because we believe that they're hearing us. And so you demonstrate your belief in God through prayer, which is just talking. That's all praying is. It's just talking to God. But we pray because we believe God is listening. And so if you're ready, if you're ready for a new life in Jesus, if you're ready for a new life, a new beginning, you can accept Jesus into your heart today. And that's the start. That's step one, step one of this process of this, this lifelong journey of building your relationship with Jesus. And so how do we do that? Well, we pray and we can pray together. You can repeat after me or you can let me pray and you can say a version of this prayer. And we simply pray this, Father, God, I know you are real. And I believe that you love me. I ask you to forgive me for living my life based on my choices and my understanding. Starting today, I want to live my life based on your understanding, God, and your will. Please send the spirit of your son, Jesus, into my heart to live in my mind so that I can live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice so that I can have life. I accept you into my heart and I trust you, Jesus, with my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, if you prayed a version of that prayer, we say hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. We celebrate, we clap. Why do we celebrate? Why do we clap? Why do we do this? Because the Bible scripture tells us that heaven rejoices, that God's kingdom rejoices when one person, one individual has a change of mind, when one individual repents, when they go in one direction and they shift and they start to walk in a different direction because they have decided to receive the spirit of Jesus and live for God. We celebrate with you just like God's kingdom celebrates with you. We want to continue this relationship, this partnership with you. Please reach out to us. You can contact us across all of the major social, social media platforms. Um, you can either contact me directly, Charles Box. You can contact the church, My Connected Church. You can fill out an information card on our website, myconnectedchurch.com, myconnectedchurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to stay in touch with you. We'd love to help you build your relationship with Jesus Christ and talk to you about some of the next steps that you can take to build and grow your relationship with your Lord and Savior family. Thank you so much again for your investment of time, for your prayers, for your support. We are so grateful to you. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay in this fight. God bless family.